And in the Pantanal, everyone was telling everyone else where they found fish. And everyone was sharing the fishing grounds. And I said, this doesn't make sense. You should have clear boundaries between you and your friend. And then you're going to be sustainable. He said, no, but it's, it's the way we live here. And so, and fish is moving and the flood pulse is, is moving as well. And we have to keep moving. We have to, to keep finding where is the fish. And if someone finds a fish somewhere else, I will tell him because tomorrow he can find fish and he will tell me. So all this reciprocity and trust. Welcome to The Possibus. The Possibus is a podcast collaboration between the Smithsonian Earth Optimism and Pelicanus. The Smithsonian Conservation Commons Earth Optimism Initiative is changing the conservation narrative from one that focuses on problems and perils to highlighting impactful solutions. By celebrating what's working in conservation, they seek to inspire action and move global community from a sense of loss to one of hope and finding solutions to save our planet. Pelicanus is a conservation-based collective in continuous wonder of the healing and encouragement that is possible on this planet and the people making it happen. We are committed to telling these stories and demonstrating optimism through science. Now in this partnership, we spotlight conservationists working with a possibilistic attitude for solution-based efforts to tackle the world's critical environmental struggles. We're attempting to reframe the narrative around conservation to show that conservation successes are possible through changes in attitude and implementation of intentional change. In this episode of The Possibilist, we talk to Dr. Rafael Cheravalotti, a Smithsonian postdoctoral fellow in the Pantanal area of Brazil, his home nation. Rafael is a biologist, anthropologist, and conservation social scientist with experience all over the world and over 10 years of experience in the Pantanal where he has focused on the sustainability of socio-ecological systems. Rafael went from working with biological resources to working with local communities to understand their sustainable agricultural processes. His work, including two books, is the kind of thing that conservation needs more of. But let's get straight to Rafael and let him tell us about the Pantanal and all of the amazing things he's been a part of. Welcome, Dr. Rafael Velot. Uh, it's very nice to have you on the Possibilist, and thank you so much for coming. Hi, Austin. Hi, Taylor. Thanks a lot for inviting me. It's, it's a really pleasure to, to, to talk with you and try to share some of these stories that I have. I think let's start with, can you tell us about the Pantanal and we can start to dissect your programs, uh, your personal interactions with it? Yes, yes, sure. I think the Pantanal, it's, uh, it's an amazing place and it's a kind of, I would say, a paradox. We, we published a, a paper two, two days or three days ago trying to describe our experience in the Pantanal. And the paper was in this International Journal of Leisure and then we are discussing why, as biologists or anthropologists, we really enjoy to go to this place that are remote, have no water, extremely hot, a lot of mosquitoes. And then the title is not this one, but we are making fun that the title should be The Joy of Working in Hell. So the Pantanal, it's, 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 it's a very tough place to work. It's, it's a very tough place to be, a lot of mosquitoes. But it's, I think it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been in my life. So it's just breathtaking when you go there and see this. It, the Pantanal, essentially, it's a swamp, but it's a swamp in the size of California. So it's the size of England. So it's, it's just a huge, huge swamp. And you never, like, it's endless. Just the landscape is it's just breathtaking. You see jaguars, you see birds and everything. But at the same time, in mixed with this beauty, you have this extremely hot place where sweating all the time you have mosquitoes biting you snake all over the place so i think it's it's an it's a very interesting place to be most of the people who went to work in the pantanal they just like spent a, a week and, and left because they couldn't deal with the 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 environmental conditions there but i think it's beautiful and at the same time this just to to describe more the pantanal the pantanal is also uh uh a very interesting case study of sustainability because most of the Pantanal are cattle ranches and people are producing over 4 million heads of cattle in the Pantanal, in the middle of the Pantanal. People are fishing tons of fish in the Pantanal. But even then, it's a sustainable place. It's, it's a place that you can see jaguars. It's most of the native vegetation is there. So 
I, I think it's very intriguing when I always think about the Pantanal. So it's, it's a terrible place to be because of mosquitoes, the heat, but it's beautiful and breathtaking. It's a place where you, most of the places are cattle ranching, cattle ranches producing cattle, millions of cattle, but at the same time sustainable. So I think this, this complexity, it really attracts me. And I think it's the, the beauty of the place. You know, I've done a little bit of research and looking into it, and it sounds just like an amazing place. But like you said, it's it sounds just difficult. Like Taylor mentioned, we we've been we're down in Belize recently, and even that is you know the mosquitoes, the humidity that was enough for me. So I can't imagine living in the middle of that. Um, but at the same time, you know, that's like a, an ecologist dream right there. Can you kind of give us like? Um, you know, a short list of the major ecological issues that the Pantanal is facing and, and why, are, why are they occurring? Okay, so if we can try to characterize the Pantanal, the main feature of the Pantanal, it's the flood poles. So the Pantanal get floods and, and rise every year. So it's, it's, it's a huge area the size of England that gets flooded. 80% of the Pantanal can be flooded in a year and then rise again. And, and, this, and because it's extremely flat, this creates a huge unpredictability in terms of ecological dynamics and also ecological dynamics. And this leads to a very unique way of managing resource. So the way people manage the cattle range, the way fishermen fish, the way the culture in the Pantanal have developed is adapted to this unpredictability of resource. So the Pantanal is extremely unpredictable. And this led to very unique kind of social ecological systems. So the water in the Pantanal is what dictates life. It's what di dictates culture. It's what dictates its sustainability. And, and now there are some <clears throat> proposals, sorry, to build dams around the Pantanal to control the flood poles in the Pantanal. And then if you start to control the floods in the Pantanal, you just skew everything that is in the Pantanal. You kill this, 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 you know, this dynamic, this social ecological dynamic that the Pantanal is, is it stands out from, from all the other place. The sustainability of the Pantanal, the culture, everything will, will not resist if there's no water. So I, I would say that this is the biggest threat. Can you kind of explain a little bit more about wetland cattle ranching? Because I'm assuming that's why this water is being diverted is for those reasons. And I, to me, that the, the idea of land and cattle ranching going together, it doesn't really make sense. Like, how do you, how do, you do that? <laughs> it's, it, it, it's fun because in the Pantanal, it, it works really well. So it's the, the reason they're they are trying to, to, to build the dams, not for to increase the area for cattle ranching. The, the reason they are building these dams is to produce energy. So that, that, that's the main reason they are proposing this hundreds of dams around the Pantanal because the Pantanal, we, it's in the middle of South America and it's a hole. So it's a hole in the middle of South America. And there's a, a very nice picture I, I took from the, from the plane, in fact. And you can see like there's the highland and the Pantanal on, on the lowland. So it's, it's, it's very like, much like this. And then because of this, this difference of, the, of, of, know, of, of height, whatever you can call this, they, they're trying to produce energy. But the Pantanal, and I think the, 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 the history of the Pantanal, it's, it's, it's amazing. So the first, one of the first guys, or the colonizers who came in the Pantanal was Cabeça de Vaca. He was in America before. He was like walking around America and then he came back to Spain and then he came to the Pantanal in 1542. And he already set up a city in the Pantanal called Porto dos Reis. And after three years trying to find gold, trying to find silver around the Pantanal. He didn't find anything, but so he was arrested and then sent it back to, to Spain. But when he came to the Pantanal in 1542, he already brought cattle. And when the Spanish left, left the Pantanal and after a hundred years, the Portuguese came. So the cattle in the Pantanal was always there. And again, we always come back and something this is important. The predictability of the Pantanal always protected the Pantanal for expanding or replacing the natural grassland with 
you know, invasive or exotic grassland or other types of grassland. So when they, in, in, the, in the second war, in the first and the second world war, people saw the Pantanal as a place to produce jerk beef. I think that that's the name, but I, I'm not sure this is the correct name, but to produce beef to, to feed soldiers uh, uh, in the war. And they start to build a railway. They start to build a lot of like, infrastructure projects in the Pantanal in order to increase production, in order to replace the native vegetation with exotic grass, increase the production of cattle. But most of this infrastructure was destroyed by the flood. So the unpredictability again protected the Pantanal. So the Pantanal kept producing cattle, but most of the cattle is fed by native grasses. So it's, it's, it's a mix of, it, they use the native grasses, they don't, there's a lot of conflict in terms of wildlife. So the, most of the, not all, all the cattle, but most of the cattle range in the Pantanal is, is sustainable. So Taylor and I recently had a discussion uh, with someone in Belize, actually, uh, about sustainability when it comes to uh, agroforestry uh, forestry projects. And sustainability can mean a lot of things. And so when it comes to, you know, sustainable uh, logging, it really just means that they'll be able to continue logging. It doesn't, it's not really sustainable for the ecosystem of the area. It's, it, it's, it's a sustainable business model. So when you talk about sustainability in terms of uh, cattle ranching, ranching in the Pantanal, can you kind of just like give, give us some context with that? <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, it's very weird. And, and I, I, it took me like years to, to <laughs> better understand what I was talking about. But the point is, when we see like in terms of what is sustainability in the Pantanal, and I think that's a very good question. So when we see species that are endangered in, in other places, like in the Atlantic forest in Brazil or in Cerrado, I would say the blue macaw, jaguars, marsh deer. So most of these species, they are endangered in, in, in Brazil. But in the Pantanal, they, ha they have a health population, though, though people have been counting these species and they, the numbers are, is not decreasing, at least in the last 10 years, for instance. So they, they did have uh, a health population. So it means that those species that are endangered in other place, they are not endangered in the Pantanal. And also in terms of native vegetation. So the Pantanal has 80% of, 80 of the native vegetation in the Pantanal is still standing. So very different from the Atlantic forest, for instance, which is less than 10% is, is still there. So the, what I mean by sustainability is 90% 9, 9 of the Pantanal are cattle ranches, cattle ranches, and they're producing cattle. And at the same time, we see populations of endangered species. And also we see a large quantity of, of native vegetation. And of course, there are a lot of things that we can discuss here. So in terms of carbon, people say it is not sustainable because you're, the cattle is eating the carbon and then you're exporting the, the cattle to somewhere else or you're, you're exporting cattle. So this, in this case, not sustainable. There are a lot of, a lot of aspects of the cattle ranging that's not sustainable. But what I mean by sustainable beef or sustainable cattle ranging is that the native vegetation is there and also some endangered species, endangered species. Okay, so that's like, at least in my mind, that's the, the good version of the word sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> you just said that there's 90% of the Pantanal is cattle ranches. Is that, that, that's the correct number? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that means that probably 100% of your work is working with private landowners. Yep. Okay. Wow. All right. So I guess with that in mind, can you talk about your, your postdoc fellowship with the Smithsonian and the research you've been doing um, with the, the communities? Yes. So, it, and I think it's, if I can try to talk a bit, a, a bit about my, my own story, which I think it's explained what, I, what I'm doing now. Which, 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 so I was a biologist like, like this. <laughs> I did a, a, my, my first degree in biology and for some extremely random reason, I went to London and I end up doing a PhD in anthropology. So I, I'm something that we can call a social conservation, social science conservation 
something like this. And when I was doing my, my PhD in London in anthropology, there were a lot of like social science or, or social anthropology, a lot of very complex things. But one of the things I, I did was to do this ethnography. And I spent six months living with fishery communities in the Pantanal. So I wasn't working with Cataracted at the time, but I, worked in, I was working with fisheries. And I lived, lived it with them. So I went for, I went fishing. I did all the things they did. But I, I, I dealt with the mosquitoes. I dealt with, with the heat. I remember sleeping in a tent and the jaguar passing by in the night, anacondas, like not eating for, for a few days because the water was not, not good. So they couldn't eat. So it was all, all the, the complexity, as I was told, telling you, to live in the middle of, of, of the Pantanal. I went through, of course, not for years, but at least for six months Why I was living with the fishermen. And then I started to see how important it was to talk with people. And when I was in the Pantanal, I started to understand how people were dealing with this complexity. And it was funny because after I went to, to, I went to live with these communities of fisheries, I realized that no one went before me to do this kind of research. No one ever have talked with them. No one ever interviewed these people because they saw it was complicated. They saw it was like the environment was extremely hard. But I end up getting some expertise and enjoying this because I, I, I think that I really, it's my thing, like I, I really like this, this idea of uncertainty and how people with uncertainty, I think it's my life is it's ex- unpredictable, not their lives, but lives in gen- life in general is very predictable. And I like to, to understand how they deal with this, maybe to help me to deal with my own lives. Maybe that's the reason I'm doing this kind of research. And, and when I finished my PhD, we start, we realize, and that's funny to realize this now, we realize that we had to work with ranchers in, in the Pantanal in order to think about conservation because most of the, the, the work in the Pantanal it's, it's focused on trying to save species, one or two species is trying to, and this is really important, but if you want to change something in terms of conservation, we have to think about the group of ranchers, we have to, to talk with them, find some kind of network, find a way them to, to talk, to exchange, exchange knowledge. So I think when we, 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 we saw this as a, an opportunity and we went to talk with Smith, Sonia, and they understood that, oh, this is a very good idea to, to talk with ranchers, to understand their perceptions, to understand if they are willing to, 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 to protect the Pantanal or if it's the culture, culture is changing. It's very difficult. But at the same time, I, I have been doing this for the last five or six years. And I think this is, it is, is very important and I enjoy it because I, I, I learn a lot with them. So it sounds as if most of your uh, most of your research was more just since you were said you were the first person out there. It's more just information gathering, just getting everyone's opinions, getting everyone's methods on on ranching and how they feel about it, and then just kind of compiling that all into you know document or whatever, just to say like you know yeah. here's kind of the general consensus on how we they do things. We we are doing two things at the same time. So. On the one hand, and then this is my, my, my job, is to talk with ranchers to understand what they want with the, the range, if they want to deforest everything to replace the native vegetation with grassland that can increase their production, or if they want to do what they have been doing the last 200 years. That's my job. At the same time, I have a team on like a group of researchers on the field collecting data and trying to, to help the help in Brapa, which is a, a, a research center in Brazil, to develop the certification program. So we're trying to, to do the, both things. We're trying to, we are developing this certification program to certify those ranges that are sustainable and they can have some kind of economic benefits if they are certified. But at the same time, we are trying to understand if ranchers want to be certified or not, right? If you are developing something that is useless, because if the, no one wants to use it, what, what is the point of developing this? So I'm talking with ranchers, trying to understand if they want this kind of thing, but also, of course, trying to convince them to have some kind of certification. The, I kind of read a little bit of the certification program. Uh, uh, 
Um, and it sounds like a really cool idea. Uh, can you kind of just give a little bit more uh, context and, and background of what it takes to be certified and, and what that actually means in terms of practice? Again, we have to come back to the, the history of the Pantanal, as I was saying. So cattle have been producing in the Pantanal since the, the early, uh, early colonizers, since the early 16th century in the Pantanal. And then for the last 200 years, we have we start to see cattle ranches. So the cattle ranches, cattle ranches in the Pantanal, cattle range in the Pantanal, it's mostly sustainable. Most of the ranges is, uh, is, is producing cattle, let's put it, producing cattle over native grasses. And at the same time, we see endangered species there. And so the certification, it's not to change behavior. And this is very important. It's very different from most of the certification. We are not saying what you're doing is wrong, do this. What we are saying is, keep doing what we have been doing for the last 200 years. And if you keep doing this, if you don't change the way you have been doing this, we can certify you and we can find economic benefits. So the certification protocol, it looks at, at the presence of endangered species such as jaguar in the property. If we can record jaguars, it's, 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 it, it score more in the certification process, in the certification protocol. The quantity, of, the quantity of native vegetation in the range, if the range is 100% of native vegetation, we score more in the certification protocol. So mostly this is the environmental aspects of the certification. The certification also look to sustainability in terms of economics, if the, the range is sustainable, if it's producing, if it's generating money, essentially and also in social aspects as well. Because in the past and because of the isolation of the Pantanal, there were a lot of people were working for like very similar to slaves in, in some ranches. So it's important to, to, to assure that ranchers are hiring, are paying the, 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 the employees well and all this kind of thing. So the certification is looking at these three main parts. The environment, if the area is is most of is native vegetation, if there is endangered species like jaguars specifically, also if the cattle, if the range is generating money, and also if the rancher, the, the owner of the range is, is respecting the labor legislations and other things. I think that's so cool because uh, it's one thing we talked about when we uh, had a conversation with uh, Dr. Gladys in U Uganda, Getting into this field, going to university, you kind of learn about these projects that is like these, you know, from the bottom up projects where it's all community based conservation and how in, in order to get anything real done, you need to include the local population, the local communities, you know, take into mind their culture and kind of, you know, that's the best way to do it. And so when you actually see examples of it working it's just so cool to me it's just like oh wait <laughs> i learned about this 10 years ago and you're actually doing it it's 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 so cool i i, I just get i get nerded out you know i fanboy about this kind of stuff um especially when it, it works you know it, it, that's one thing we keep finding is that you know the more people we talk to the more we realize hey this conservation stuff actually works you know <laughs> and i think especially in this case it's so interesting that you know, with most of the world saying uh, cattle ranching is terrible, get away from cattle ranching. Uh, you're actually seeing that it's, it's, you can do it in a sustainable way. And I love that you're considering the, the local culture and human rights, but also are there apex predators on your land? I think that just mixing that all together is just so cool. And I don't even know if I have a question. I just was like, I just got really excited. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, 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 it's it's very exciting, and I really love this this kind of projects, and I really love the Pantanal. But and of course, I'm part of this long term project, so there are a lot of people who did this in the past and was working certification. So a lot of people people who is around me, or, or I'm just helping other people as well. So it's it's a it's a huge team of support in everyone. It's it, I think it's 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 an amazing story, and we have to reach this because it's it's an incredible and a successful story. And then what we want, what, what we want is to keep, keep successful. Uh, I think Smithsonian played a, a very important 
role in the Pantanal. And for the last five years, I would say, six, seven years, maybe, Smithsonian started to some a series of workshops in the Pantanal. So they, they held when I wasn't part when I wasn't part of, of Smithsonian. So they held one or three or four workshops in the Pantanal trying to gather different researchers, trying to gather to connect researchers with cattle ranchers, with policymakers, practitioners, and so on. And I think this really created a, a, a new environment, or I would say a new, new understanding of how important it was to connect, how important it was to communicate, and how important it was to work together. And because Mitsuri is coming from outside, and had this very like nice approach to say, oh, I don't, I'm, I don't work in the Pantanal, but I want to learn with you, and I, I, I want to 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 have to be a partner to, on the Pantanal. People really thought this this Smithsonian could play a. They they really understood the importance of Smithsonian there to connect everyone because in the past there were a lot of NGO, NGOs that they were not were not working with one another because there were some like his past history about funding and other things. So I think this is everywhere. But because it's Smithsonian, Smithsonian it's, it, it, it's seen in the Pantanal as, as, as like a university or a research institute, it's not an NGO, but something as a research institute. And it did, it did invite everyone to, to talk in the beginning. Now people do understand that they have a, an important role in not to do research itself, but also more, maybe most more important to connect the different stakeholders that are on the ground and help them to work together. I think this is, of course, I'm, I'm part of Smithsonian and doing research, talking with ranchers, and then we have other colleagues also doing research. But I would say, maybe it's not, I'm, I'm wrong, but I would say coming from the Pantanal, the most important role Smithsonian has today is to to give this space is to give to open space for a dialogue and to to connect different stakeholders to connect different NGOs specifically. So I think this is this is really important. But everything you were sharing about your work with the Pantanal and a lot of the issues that you guys are experiencing. Um, and, and how you're trying to go forward, it just came up with a bunch of questions for myself. If cattle ranching has been so sustainably successful for so long, um, two questions pop up, and it's basically a temporal, temporal issue. One is in the past, are the cattle that are there now, are they reproducing some ecological niche of some herbivores that were there on the, in the grasslands? Um, is there any data with that or, or why, why are they able to live so sustainably on these grasslands? Is it like a, a bison thing in North America? Um, you know, representing, you know, reproducing some of the bison experience or, and then also the other question is what, if you're giving these certifications or if, if you're, um, facilitating these certifications, um, to continue what they're doing so well. What are the things that you're afraid of them not doing? Um, are you afraid of more intensive um, herbivory? Are you uh, more, are you more, maybe afraid is not the right word, but concerned with more poaching or biodiversity hunting or, or any of those? So basically on both sides of the, the time scale there, I'm just curious about. So the first question, I, I don't think, the, one of the things that the Pantanal don't have it's a lot of research and, and i don't think we uh, i really don't know a clear answer about the, the, the first question maybe there's some answer but uh, but so the regarding the second question that's the, the, the one I, I think i have more understanding there is also as i said the biggest threat to the pantanal it's the dams around the pantanal controlling the flood but I would say the second biggest threat, it's new people coming to the Pantanal. So coming to the Pantanal. So the Pantanal, it's very isolated. There is no, there's one highway connecting with the big city, with the, the, the market. There's it's at, at least one highway. That's, that's, that, 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 that's it. And the land in the Pantanal, it's very cheap. So you can buy land 
I don't know, 10% of the price that you would buy in the Highlands. And, and nowadays, a lot of people are seeing the Pantanal as a good place to invest. And, and with political power, they see that they can convince government to build highways, to build new infrastructure. So buying land in a very low, pli- low price, they can convince someone to build a highway and then sell the land in a, in a higher price or replace the native vegetation in a very similar process that we see in the Amazon. And I think that, that, that this is the, what we, we are afraid. And if we can give some economic benefits for our ranchers to be profitable or, or to have a good profit out of this sustainable cattle, we, we believe, and of course, this is part of the, the trying to understand perceptions and, and the social research we are doing with them, that they would not sell their land to someone else trying to deforest. So that's it. because it's profitable. It's that they're making a lot of money if they have these economic benefits. And with the economic benefits, the price of the land will increase. So it will balance with the, the price of other place. That's the other place. Thank you. Yeah, because it, it, it is very curious to me, like Austin was saying, uh, how interesting that a conservationist is is trying to promote and encourage you know <laughs> cattle ranching um but it, it completely makes sense when what you're saying uh with what you're saying and how sustainable it has been so uh, thank you for clarifying the the biggest threats uh, dams and development and uh, mm. i think that's something that we see all over the world in a lot of places um especially just various kinds of development yeah. uh, uh, I understand it's, 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 it, it seems, as I said, the Pantanal is a paradox. And in and, and my talk, it's a bit of a paradox. Conservation is talking about cattle ranging. But I, I, of course, we can go into the debate, but I think it makes sense. And I think it's if we can find a way to, to keep the business, the sustainable business there, it, it, we, we can protect the Pantanal. That's my, my feeling. So you mentioned that your your first name is Spanish, your last name is Italian, you speak Portuguese, and you're Brazilian, uh, and you probably speak other languages. But maybe you're just the the modern man, product of globalization. But uh, can you, with that, with, I guess, with that in mind, can you kind of? Oh, and I, I know you said you spent some time in the UK. So can you kind of give us uh, some some background of how how you got into this field because it. It, it doesn't seem um, like it's the more natural way to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but and I'm the contrary of, of this. It's, it's, it's funny because my, my, my grandfather from my mom's side, was a, he was a peasant. And so they, they migrate from Italy and they were living in, 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 in the rural area. And my, my, my other grandfather, uh, grandfather was a shoemaker. So they, ext- they were extremely poor. And they were living in, in, in very rural areas. And my mom was, was born in, in the small ranch in, in, in the middle of nowhere. So my, my childhood, and I, I'm, I'm staying here, like in, in Brazil, where I'm staying now, it's in the city where I grew up, which is a very small town in the middle of the countryside of Sao Paulo. So that's, <laughs> I didn't have any, any contact with the globalization, the global world, and my, and my world was very restricted to this very, I don't know, like in, in the U.S., I would say that Texas is very like countryside and, and not, I didn't, I didn't have an idea about anything about the world. But the, the only thing I had was uh, a, a nice cousin and doing, and he was, he was raised in Brasilia, so he was raised in the capital and he did biology. It's funny to think about this story, right? When we, what made us to make the choice that we did. But anyway, and I remember during Christmas was the only moment we, 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 we met. He, he used to tell me all these stories about the Pantanal and, and everything. So he was doing the, his internship there. He was doing biology and decided to do his internship there. And all these stories. And I started to get fascinated about this. Things that I only suffered through the TV. So I never... As I said, I never, during my childhood, I never went to, to the field. I never went to the to national park. I only played football, barefoot football in the streets. That was my, my, my childhood. And 
when I was doing top in Brazil, when we finished our high school, we, we had to do a test. And this test will tell us where we, we and we, we, we can do your or, or, or degree. So I decided to do biology. And, but the only place that I accepted me was this place in Mato Grosso do Sul, which was close to Pantanal. So I was, I think I was mostly very lucky in my life. And my life put me in place that I really enjoyed. And then when I was there in, in very close to the Pantanal, I, I didn't have a place to stay. So it, it's a funny story. I don't know if we have time to tell these kind of stories, but I didn't have a place to stay. And then I remember my, my father called a, a friend of him and said, oh, I, his daughter is in, in Campo Grande, this city close to Pantanal, a city where Dr. Debies live. And she said, oh, he can stay here in, 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 on the sofa for, for a while. And when I was living there, I, I, I found out that she, she, she used to see a ghost that was sleeping with me. And every day I said, oh, how is the ghost? And I, <laughs> well, I didn't have any place to go. So I, I stayed with the ghost for, for six months, scaring, <laughs> almost dying of, afraid of the ghost. And one day I could see the ghost. And so I, I ended up starting to get involved with people who were working in the Pantanal. And, and, and then luckily I met this guy named Valfredo who is some, someone that you should talk with. He has a, an amazing story, and a story I think it's more exciting than mine. But anyway, he was working in the Pantanal and he accepted me as his intern. And I started to spend some time there. And one day I decided to write a book because I was, I think, depressed or something. I said, oh, maybe we should write, maybe we should do something that what you're doing about the outreach in science, because what we are doing is not making much sense. We should outreach what we are doing. And someone in the airport one day, a friend of mine, I, was, I met him, said, oh, I have this idea. And said, well, why you don't go to talk with this guy in London to, to because he writes books about this. And he sent an email to this guy and accepted me as his intern again. So I went to London and spent some time there. I lived in very, terrible places in London until I, I managed to, to find some money. But then when I was leaving again, I said, maybe it would be great to do a PhD. So I sent a hundred emails to a hundred people more than that. And someone replied the email and said, oh, maybe we couldn't talk, we can talk. This was the person who became my supervisor in my PhD. And so she accepted me and I spent more than four years in London doing my PhD. So it's, I think mostly this, this is the story. And I think it's I was very extremely lucky to, to be in the right place at the right time. And now I was lucky to get this, this, this fellowship or postdoc in, in Smithsonian. Yeah, I think that's another theme we've, we've hit on a, a lot is, you know, everyone kind of seems to think that they're, they're lucky to get what they have. But in our opinion, from the outside, it looks like, you know, you kind of make your own fate by working hard. <laughs> and so that's kind of what we're seeing um, from this angle. But, um, and you, you, just, you already mentioned that you're, you're going back to the UK pretty soon? Yeah, I may move next year. So after I finish this, this, this fellowship at, at Smithsonian, I've got uh, a job at Imperial College that I should start after, after I finish this. So I will come back to, to the UK, at least for a while. And then I see, <laughs> and of course, I was coming back, I was going there sooner, but my wife got pregnant and things got a bit more complex. <laughs> so, anyway, but things are moving well. And I'm, again, I, I don't complain at all. It's, I, I'm glad that I have these, all, all, the, all these options. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be nice to have your, uh, your, your child in Brazil. Mm. That'd be kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah. The weather is better here than the UK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. I love what you said earlier about the Pantanal is, is so unpredictable. It's so, there's so much uncertainty with it. And especially with what you study and how you study, it's so uncertain. And it is a reflection of all of our, the unpredictability of all of our lives and how it helps you understand your life and, and going through your life story, you know, like Austin said, you know, there's so much of the parts that feel, you know, there's a luck component and there is a fortune component, and there is the, you know, working really hard um, component, and 
I think one of the things that we find in so many conservationists, it's this incredible passion, um, this incredible passion to help a species, help a, a land that you care about, to help the people that you end up working with, um, the cattle ranchers, the rangers, the, the just everyone in the area. Um, so this incredible combination um, is very unpredictable. You, you can't mm. predict you know, the places you're going to fall in love with and it ends up happening. And, and yeah. that's just, it unfolds. And, uh, so uh, I love this, this topic of, of, about unpredictability. And when I was doing my PhD, I was reading, the, m most of my research was focused on governance of, of social ecological systems. So how people organize themselves in order to, to you know, use a resource or in order to be sustainable. And when I start to live with these communities in the Pantanal, the fisheries communities, most of, most of, sorry, most of the knowledge that I, I had read, most of the theory I had read didn't fit in the Pantanal. And so like the, the, the theory was saying that people have to have clear boundaries between people and the resource that they, they, they use, right? So the Ostrom principles and, and, and so on. And in the Pantanal, everyone was telling everyone else where they found fish, and everyone was sharing the fishing grounds. And I said, that doesn't, doesn't make sense. You should have clear boundaries between you and your friend, and then you're going to be sustainable. So no, but I, and the, 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 the fisheries, they said, no, but it's, it's the way we live here. And so, and fish is moving, and the flood pulse is, is moving as well. And we have to keep moving. We have to, to keep finding where is the fish. And if someone finds the fish somewhere else, I will tell him because tomorrow he can find the fish and he will tell me. So all this reciprocity and trust. And the cat rangers, is, I start to see the same pattern. And even though they live in, they, are, they don't have common pool resource, but they, they live in private ranches, but they have to, to take the cattle out of the Pantanal and there's no highways. So the way they do, they have this called comitiva, which is like a cowboy pass by all the ranches and take the cattle and, and, and put all the cattle together. And this cattle eat, they, they, they eat, like they, they feed in someone's land. So there's an extremely high level of reciprocity, even among the cattle ranchers as well. So it comes back to this idea of unpredictability. And then to deal with unpredictability, it's key to help one another. It's, to, it's key to have some kind of open access, some kind of, uh, I don't know, high level of reciprocity. And I think it, this, teach, like, as you said, this, is, it's, this talks about a lot about life. And especially nowadays, I think life is getting more unpredictable. We have more possibilities. We can go to the UK, we can go to the US, come back to Brazil, we have this, this more flexibility. We can get married, whoever we want to get married. So this kind of, we have choices, right? We didn't have many choices in the past. And this makes more, more uncertain. So it's like this, you have a hundred channels in your TV, you keep changing because you cannot decide where you want to go. So, and I think this is, but how you can decide, I think you can decide asking a friend and asking the help and then having this support of, of other people. So again, I, I, I like this research because <laughs> it explains some of the uncertainty of my, my own life. So, you know, one of the ideas with this uh, series is we're calling it the possibilists because we're, we're, we're basing that off of the Michael Soule quote uh, when he's asked if he's optimistic or pessimistic about uh, the environment uh, or, or whatever, uh, he just says he's possibilistic. And so we're, trying to figure that out what that means uh, and so we're asking everybody the same question like what does that mean to you um and you know we have this partnership with the smithsonian earth optimism initiative and it's just a perfect opportunity to really discuss and explore what this optimism in the face of what seems to be like an overwhelming uh, task and and what that means with the possibilistic attitude what that means to you so if you could uh, just explore that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question. So yeah, I, I was trying to read about what was possibilistic. 
<laughs> today in the afternoon. I think it's, uh, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I don't have a lot of uh, things besides predictability, but I, 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 come, I come back to this idea that you, you do what I, whatever is possible to do. Right? You, 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 we try to, to, to do our best and we, we try to, 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 to see things in, in, in a good way. And for me, possibilistic, I don't know if you pronounced the, the word correctly, but possibilistic is, is to, it's not being optimistic, it's not being pessimistic, but it's to, to understand the reality and given the reality to do our best. I would say that. Maybe that, that, that's my, my feeling. So, and that's the way the, the people in the Pantanal do. They are not, they, and someone told me this, I asked this fisherman said, so do you enjoy living in the Pantanal? And he said, it's terrible, but I, lo I love it. And, <laughs> and the same thing. So it, it, we've got these possibilities and then we, we can try to do this. We cannot predict what's gonna happen in the future, but we can do whatever we can given the, the, the choices we have now. That was great. It, it, it speaks to the, the paradox. Everything about the Pantanal seems to like uh, be, like you said, a paradox. And so I love that story. <laughs> it's terrible, but he loves it. I feel like we all can relate to that to something in our lives. <laughs> Where, you know, and I was just going to say that you sound like the most practical anthropologist I've ever met. <laughs> and everything is just, yeah, we just do what you can with what, what you what you have. And it's like, that, yeah, I mean, that's, that's true. But I was expecting uh a little bit more ethereal, but no, I love it. Great. Um, <laughs> I don't think anthropologists like me, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I think I, I think it's important when you think about conservation. It's that people are not bad or people are not good. So when we think about oh, people are destroying the Pantanal, the rangers are destroying the Pantanal, or the, it, it's it, 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 it's it's more complex than that, and we, we have to understand this complexity in order to. To think about the solutions. Sometimes it's just we just have a, a brilliant idea and, and try to, to impose our brilliant idea because we are genius. But on the ground, things are, are so complex and people are not evil, people are not good. It's just trying to survive as, as anyone else. So it's important to, to take this complexity into account when we try to, to, to do conservation. I think that's that's the, the message. Uh, I think it's it's important to to make one of the things we're, we're trying to incorporate into all of our episodes that we do now um, is how can people get involved so whether it's with uh you know the organizations that you've worked with um in you know in the pantanal uk wherever uh just kind of give some advice on how they can get involved in this uh specific uh movement issue whatever or, or just in general <laughs> yeah that's that's a good question and because sometimes it's hard to, to, to connect with some, some place that are so far from our reality. So I think it's, but there are a few ways that people can, can connect. The first, I think it's coming to the Pantanal and, and try to experience the Pantanal. So in you know, last year, we, we had the daughter of a famous singer in Canada. I can't remember the band, but he was like a rock band in, in Canada. And then his daughter came to, to the Pantanal and she really enjoyed it. So it was fun. Anyway, so, and we always receive interns, people from, we had someone from New Zealand, Italy, US, so we always, are, we are always open to receive interns, people trying to, like, willing to experience some of the reality in the Pantanal. So this is one way to, to be more connected with the Pantanal. In other ways, I think there are a lot of, like, the Pantanal is connected with what the Congress in the US is, is thinking. So sometimes the decisions that what is gonna happen in the Pantanal, it's, it's made in the Congress in the US because it's an investment funded by someone else, somewhere, somewhere else. So I think it's, it's always important to, to think about who are you voting or who are the politicians are you supporting because they do have a consequence everywhere in, in this, specifically in South America, I would say in the Amazon, in the Pantanal. And I think third is what you buy, right? So we, we are buying stuff and this can have a huge consequence on, on, on the ground. So if, if you are 
buying beef from a, an area that is deforesting the Amazon, you are funding deforestation in the Amazon. That's it's important to, to, to bear in mind. So I think if you can change our behavior in terms of, of, of you know, buying stuff, that's, that's important as well. Well, Rafael, thank you so much for joining us. We had a, a great time talking with you and uh, good luck on everything that you're doing. And hey, congratulations on the, the coming baby. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, Austin and, and Taylor. That was, I always feel happy to, to, to share my, my own experience. And, and, and again, I would like to, to congratulate you both for, for doing this, for doing this fantastic podcast. And, and I think, as I said, it's, it's key to outreach what we are doing. And it's key to have people like you who are investing your time, your money sometimes to do this kind of, this kind of I don't know, stuff. So well done. And thanks again for inviting me to talk. We want to say thank you to Rafael for taking the time to talk with us. He is truly an inspiration. We hope that his work can serve as a model and inspiration for others around the world. Hosts and producers for this episode are Austin and Taylor Parker. Producers are Kat Coots and Andrea Santi. Music was provided by a Picture Book Studios. Please like, comment, and subscribe to our page if you haven't already. And thank you for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time.